this one's definitely been you know, about six years in the making with the initial germ of the idea, the wisp of the idea. I like that. Uh, way Pitched way back in 2004 by Brenda Chapman, uh, one of our directors in development. And as a filmmaker-driven studio, all the ideas come from right there in the studio. And uh, so Brenda pitched um, the earliest idea about... Uh, uh, th that was inspired by her relationship with her own daughter. She had a six-year-old uh, daughter who was um, very feisty and opinionated already at six. And Brenda thought, what kind of teenager will this make? And, and out of that relationship, she began to, to weave the tail and, and pitch that initial idea to John Lasseter and our creative brain trust. And so that was the, okay, yes, let's develop this into a film. Um, but you know, in terms of putting a crew together and all that, that didn't happen until more like 2006 to become the movie that you see today. Brenda Chapman being of Scottish heritage, Mark Andrews, our director, also being of Scottish heritage, is turns out and having this um, having great love for the country it was this perfect landscape steeped in story and myth and legend for this this folktale idea so some of the first research books were my books that I brought in on Scotland and on Scottish legends and stuff like that um, to give to Brenda and the crew to start just picking through and, and, and you know looking at it and you know whatever they can pull from the legends and myths that might make you know, uh, give them more information to help build the story, uh, the stuff about the, the clan symbols. You know, that's ancient Scottish legends uh, that go way back to Celtic mythos, um, will-the-wisps, you know, th those kind of things. This thing that is animation filmmaking is never in context. You know, we don't go out on in the sets or out on locations with the actors and the lights and everything and go, okay, here's your pages. Now go set the camera up here and come down. Now go. And you see the scene unfold. We don't see the scene unfold. We have to make, create the scene to unfold and then get it in a format where we could see it unfold then to start making those decisions that you make on the set or uh, in live action, you know, um, on location instantaneously, you know, so the actor may come down and you go, ah, ah, okay, now that I'm seeing it, let's change it and do this, you know, come in a little bit more aggressive and, you know, uh, let's see what happens, you know, and you get that spontaneity happening. So we have to constantly build up to a state of context because we're working with so many different little pieces. I mean, we start with a script, we're basically rewriting right. constantly. Okay. Uh, and we put the film up on reels in storyboard form three or four times a year. Is that right? Yeah. And and basically rewriting every cycle and, and redrawing. And, and, and on this film, we did it a huge amount. I mean, I think we had 130 scenes in story, and there's 36 scenes in the movie. So we went through a lot of stuff for this movie. Well, in live action, you have a, uh, they have a, Two months shoot or whatever, and, and the footage you get is the footage you're stuck with. And in in animation, uh, you can do anything, and it's, and it, you can. Uh, I mean, I always say the uh, good news is you can do anything. The bad news is you can do anything. <laughs> it's because it's 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 kind of endless, and it's uh, but it's it's an, also an amazing process. Our goal for the sets and environments is to feel like we were really in Scotland and not filming it down in San Jose or you know, Boston or something. We really tried to pull the nuggets of Scotland. Um, we did a lot of research in the clothing that was set back in the 10th, 11th century. Uh, so we really try to do our research and know our stuff so it's believable. Then once we do that, we can kind of shoot off and caricature things a bit. You'll start seeing things that are more designed in the film and less realistic. We don't ever want to hit you over the head with it and sort of start putting Celtic knots in the clouds or things. Mm -hmm. But they're, they are there subtly sort of exposed in the vi visuals of the film. Early on Brave, I was doing some lighting tests on the forest. And as the computers want to do, it sort of um, barfed on me a little bit. And it dropped all the lights out of the scene, but left the mist there, which is a very important part of setting a movie in Scotland is, you know, there's all this mist. And in the forest, the mist is this beautiful thing. So suddenly I had no light but mist, and I got all of these incredible silhouettes of all of these Scottish plants and all of this depth without kind of um, overwhelming busyness. And it became this thing that I fell in love with, sort of. And so we were going for a, a sort of a theatrical lighting setup with the, the light orchestrated in the forest where the action was happening. 
but then uh, I let the light fall off into the forest so it would actually go black, which served the story in two different ways, which is we have this forest where all this mysticism happens and all of these, um, you know, our twists and turns happen there. And so letting things go off into darkness leaves it much more mysterious. You have no idea what's going to happen. And it's also this really great metaphor for a teenage girl. You know, in the castle, she's comfortable. She's around her parents and her family. But, you know, as a teenager, you've sort of got one step into the, the next world, which is a much more uncomfortable place where you don't know what's going on. And so when she's in the forest and you, you sort of never know what's out there, and it's sort of supporting that, that one foot in both worlds kind of thing. 